Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Friday Night Stocks to Buy. We're on episode 11 now, I believe. is We're going to be diving down into Steve Eisman, man. The guy's more bullish than I've ever seen. We're going to be stepping back into stocks to buy this week as I picked up some stock. The markets are down. We're going to review your questions for your answers on some recent posts that I've done this week, just to get caught up on where we've gone through over the last week. And we're going to step back in time, most importantly, to see this innovation marvel that we're living in. We're going to go back to the future to see what people thought in like the 1980s and 90s, where we would be today. And I promise you it's going to blow your mind because people were right, but not in the way you would think. But we got to step back, take a breath, because obviously it's Friday, guys. So get a drink. I'm surprised how many of you stopped by at a 10 o'clock evening if you're on the eastern time zone for things so cheers but let's get into this shall we <laughs> let's unwind a little bit because it's been one heck of a week hasn't it been but first and foremost steve eisman yeah uh <laughs> great hockey player i don't think we're talking about him but nonetheless for those of you that are in the the know if you haven't watched this video yet it's kind of blowing up right now because this is probably like the most bullish I've ever heard coming out of these guys from the big short, considering like the rhetoric last time this dude was on CNBC, just ripping about bank stocks, still doesn't like banks that much, but take a listen just to some bits and pieces of this because ah, it was a different take. They're looking at the biggest profits plunge since the pandemic, just in terms of what to expect from companies' earnings in the first quarter. They're going to be down sharply because margins are going to get squeezed pretty tightly. Um, it's a lot of scary news. You can understand the red arrows. It's this not month, that, but what do you it's think? It's not that scary. Okay, talk and, us and, through and, it. And first of all, I'm sort of amused by people's reactions to the Fed. Every single meeting, the Fed says the rates are going to be longer for higher, and everybody doesn't believe them. And now this time they finally believe them. Wait, I mean, longer for higher? How does that work? Higher for longer. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> because people, yeah, cause, cause cause people are cautiously <laughs> optimistic or optimistically no, they cautious. They say higher for longer. Higher for time, and everybody says, we don't believe you. And finally, after the 15th time, they say higher for longer. People say, okay, that's bad. Okay, I mean, maybe maybe that's, they're just hitting reality, which is if it's not higher for longer, it's going to be because a recession is starting to set in and the economy's turned down pretty significantly. And yeah, the crazy thing is, is we've already seen a technical recession because the U.S. has already had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. But now that things are just trucking along, like seemingly smoothly based off earnings, just listen, I'm interrupting. Neither of those are great options. I mean, I don't see it that way. I mean, okay. at this point, everybody's basically been wrong about the economy. You know, people who are Ooh, negative yes. are positive. People who are positive were negative. There's no, I mean, look, there's an economist I really respect, Ed Hyman. And a few months ago, Ed went negative and said there's a recession coming. And I saw him a, a week or so ago, and even he admits there's no actual evidence that a recession is coming. He just thinks it's coming. So, you know, this what is changed, a, What changed his mind? Is there a C.J. Lawrence still around? Is that No, no, he's doing? with the Evercore. These guys. Evercore. Um, I mean, he just thinks rates are going to... Um, eventually cause the economy to go into recession like but, people been, but people have been saying that for the last year and a half so look i'm not an economist See, that's the funny thing right historically when rates have shot up dramatically it's kind of plunged most actually i don't think there's been a single time in the last 20 or 30 years where this hasn't plunged us into a recession but like i've been saying rates have been up for a while and the economy seems to be doing just fine with it unusually maybe some aspects no but this this is a very humbling business you could be right one day you could be wrong the next you could be right and wrong on the same day you know at this point there's no evidence it's a recession is coming at all maybe it is but do they, what, do they need relax. relax but do they need a recession to, to break the back of inflation if it doesn't I mean, at this point it doesn't seem like they do so it'll come down i mean look I, like i said i'm an economist i'm totally data driven you know at this point inflation's coming down the economy is strong and people are getting hysterical because the fed says that rates are going to be higher for longer so I, i'm not so hysterical what what do you think when you see the market? You see prices where they are. Do you see bargains in abundance? I mean, some, you... are, some are starting to develop again. You know, there's yeah. been a correction. Maybe there'll be more of a correction. You but... call what we've been through a correction at this point? A little correction. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> modest. Maybe there'll be more. You know, tech has had something of a correction. You know, if there's a correction, at, at this point, since I don't see a recession company, I'm more inclined to say they're buying opportunities and shorting opportunities. Thank you. Well, except in the banking sector. Okay. Let's talk buying opportunities, and then we'll get back to the banking sector. Where do you see buying opportunities? I mean, I think there's some infrastructure companies that are coming in. You know, the money that the government is going to be spending has just been a trickle this year. It's really going to come in starting next year. I mean, if you speak to the companies, they'll all say, it's really not having any impact on our earnings yet. 
but a lot of plans are being drawn up. You know, I expect 2024 and 2025 to be massive years for infrastructure type companies. So, so, yeah, he's heavy into the infrastructure play just because of government spending. He doesn't really get into much else other than he's still not a big fan of the banks just because they're not getting any kind of earnings growth out of this market. And obviously, I think there's a disparity between talking about U.S. banks and Canadian banks. because I'm still bullish on Canadian banks, but we'll kind of wrap back around to that. I don't know what infrastructure plays this guy's into because he's not allowed to say specific stocks, um, but he's been touting that pretty much for the last three to six months. He's been infrastructure, government spending. That's where it's going. You know, you can take a look at some of the EV, the warehousing, the roads. I mean, find some of the companies that can benefit from that. If you guys know any, let me know in the comment section below. Perhaps that would be worth doing a video on in and of itself, because I don't know anyone that's doing a video on what Steve Eisman's talking about here. But let's get into some of the comments, the questions, what's been going on this week, because there's been a lot of insightful things. Uh, first and foremost, I think we are on the precipice of a massive of massive deflation so these dividend yields while juicy now will erode a lot and i think that's very dependent on what you're buying i mean we're seeing some erosion happening already we'll talk about some of these broader etfs schd you know why some of them aren't actually uh, we're not seeing dividend bumps anymore they actually look like they're going down but honestly I don't think that's the case for, I, I don't think we're going to see the growth we've seen for the next year or two out of a lot of dividend companies, but it depends on what you're buying. Cause I mean, there's some pretty foundational if you're not buying stocks that are yielding seven to 8%, like I don't think telecoms are going to be increasing their dividends dramatically here. But if you're buying something like railways, or if you're buying something that has some growth factor behind it, like the consumer staples, your Procter and Gamble's of the world, that their payout ratios are, are so damn favorable and they're still seeing some margin increasing, those companies are going to increase their dividends, right? It really just depends on what you're playing. And I love the fear in this comment because this is what makes me always want to buy stocks because people will start getting turned off from fundamentally great companies. And when you see things like Apple and these just incredible stocks pull back, it's typically historically, and as I said, always a damn buying opportunity, right? I said the last time the market went this low, buy. Markets are back down to where they were from what, the, the mid of August, and I'm buying right now again. And we'll talk about some of the stocks, but loaded up on VFV and uh, VDY today. So congrats. Yes, sir. I jumped into VFV as well. For those of you that don't know, VFV is just the Canadian version of the S&P 500. And that's I pretty much bought some VOO today. They're someone's two favorite stocks. Taking a look at the actual positions that I picked up. Unfortunately, uh, in my corporate account, it doesn't show the updates because uh, I only really picked up about $1,000 for like a couple shares uh, from the Canadian Valley. Nothing huge, but I can't help but see these deals. Like the market's down, I'm going to buy it. I think I, I wish it would show my average cost, but every time I buy shares in Royal Bank, it takes like a day or two to actually update the book cost. But I think total, uh, now that the market's pulled back, I think my entire 50,000 US dollar position in this account, just in the S&P is up, up about 4,000 bucks. It's not up huge, um, but I got it in. I've been cost averaging into it for a little while now. So I, I'm fairly green on the position. I'll have to update that when it comes back around, but it's probably my largest position in this current moment. Uh, someone's saying, I just watched your video and was curious um, if you would elaborate. Let me make sure I'm sharing these questions to you guys. If you could elaborate why you uh, wouldn't use your business for passive income, CRA allows small businesses to earn passive income up to $50,000 per year. Over $50,000, it starts to decrease. Your small business threshold starts to decrease from $500,000. Uh, bucks. So when it comes to passive income, the worst thing you can do is buy it in a corporation because, yes, it is taxed like there's no tomorrow. I think they tax dividends at 50 damn percent unless, however, you pay it out. And I've always had a little strategy that, like, you know, I'm, I'm primarily putting growth stocks within there for now, kind of controlling. The, the gains and the passive income when I want to. And then if I pay it out to myself, you don't pay any tax. And then that tax gets passed on to me. And then I can decide how I, I want it to be taxed. I could pay myself a salary, could pay myself a dividend. I could just dump it into my RRSP contribution room and pay no tax on it. Honestly, I just have the corporation for a place to get really discounted uh, tax rates. Like it's like 10%, 15% on the first half a million. And then from there, it's just, I'm using it as capital expenditure so I don't pay tax, right? It's a smart way of doing things. I don't pay for my phone bill. So I don't get double taxed because you make money at a job, you get taxed, you pay your phone bill, you get taxed. Whereas in a corporation, you can just pay your phone bill and then you don't have to pay any income tax. So I just use it for a lot of expenditures, but I also use it for liability, right? Business is you, the smart thing, everyone to some degree should start a side hustle and open a business. And when you make money and you put in a corporation, it is legally you know, disconnected from you. It is now a separate entity. You have all these liability and controllable things that you, you don't have in your personal name. Hell, if I die tomorrow, 
you know, I could leave those shares to my wife and she just takes the share. She doesn't have to sell any of the stock or my wife divorces me. Guess what? She can't really come after what's in the corporation. So it kind of works both ends there. Not that I'm ever thinking of a divorce. I love my wife very much. Hopefully she's not watching this stream. Uh, anyone notice that SEHD dividend of 65 cents? Uh, are we not? Are we satisfied or is this a dis, uh, disappointing? Yeah. So SEHD is one of my largest holdings outside of BOO right now. And I have purely only in my RSP SEHD. HD and I've got about 46,000 US in here now down a couple percentage points on it. Uh, I've been holding this one now for a little bit while uh, and the dividend yield is not accurate. It says it's 4.57%. Update your shit, Scotiabank. Um, but yeah, I think the dividend yield is like 3.6 or something. Uh, they went through a bit of a reweighting, right? So uh, we kind of went through, what was that, a quarter ago, a couple quarters ago. Anyways, SCHD reweighted uh, their holdings. So basically the dividend payouts were obviously going to change with that. And we're in a time where I don't trust the market that much. I'm not looking for dividend increases that much. I'm expecting over a long period of time when things normalize, the dividends will come back probably with a vengeance in the next maybe like what? two years. But for now, we're just kind of sitting in this this volatile market. And the reason I went into index funds, and I step back and say this, I think you guys might recall the, the ADHD kind of crazy skitzed out, constantly buying and selling, not sure what I was doing in 2022, because the era of fun passed us, man, like the era, the era of easy money, finding unicorns just by throwing a dart at a board. Those days are past, right? I don't trust what's going on here, like Facebook going from 300 to 90. Heaven forbid, you know, good faith on my my wonderful fiance who held Facebook through that volatile ride, but I couldn't do it. And I just don't know who's going to come out on the other side of this. I just didn't know. Right. So I put it into the ETFs to let them auto weight. And then I was just hand selecting a few companies. That was it. I'm like, I can't have a full portfolio of individual stocks because I don't know who's going to survive this market. That's how sketchy it was back then. Right. I mean, we're talking about a year ago. So I like SCHD. It just it gives me some really good you know, diversification. It's passive. They do all the waiting for me. I set it up on a drip and I forget it. I'm not worried about what stock to buy. The stock's down 50%. Should I just put my new investment capital in here? Is it going to go lower? Is the company have issues? I don't have time for all that research today. It gets more convoluted in time. I mean, look at PPC Ian. PPC Ian is even buying SCHD now. That dude's owned individual dividend stocks his whole life. Uh, you made almost $60,000 doing this Man, I'm in the wrong profession. You aren't even a big. You aren't even big, and it's kind of uh, and blah, blah, blah. man. I'm in the wrong profession. You aren't even that big, and it's that kind of return. Wow. Let's see if I can spit that out correctly. This guy's talking about uh, the video I posted this week where I was talking about my YouTube income. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was kind of just. Uh, unveiling how much money my YouTube channel's made, which I think when I posted that video was like 59,000, 60,000 bucks. Hopefully by the end of the year, it'll be closer to 70, maybe 75. But I think people are kind of impressed because I don't have a lot of subscribers, 18,000 over the whole year. I wasn't even at the beginning of the year, maybe 15 or lower. So it's kind of impressive that these small finance channels can produce such revenue, right? But I just like revealing that stuff to show you guys that there's real opportunity in this space. And I've tried to help so many people in the YouTube space get down the path I've been on. And they just won't do it. They they won't do it. I was just talking to a guy today on TikTok Live, a really famous guy here in Canada that basically looks at Canadian housing and compares it to castles in Italy and stuff. It just like the price differentiating. And he's like, oh, I'm just doing this for fun. I'm not making any money. The guy's getting like a million plus views like every couple of weeks right now. It's kind of crazy. And I'm like, bro, like, what do you go get an agent? And he's like, I don't want to pay for an agent. I'm like, bro, agents are free. <laughs> they don't make money unless you do. Like, I just can't figure out how people are so business unminded. They just don't. They just, they just don't go, they don't sniff the money out and figure out how to make it work. I just, I can't figure it out. I'm like, there's so much money in the YouTube and, and TikTok and this whole sphere still that I wish people were a little bit more inclined uh, to talk to somebody with experience and try and get into it. Because man, you sit at home, you post videos and as this next comment states, you got to take it seriously, right? People have no idea uh, how tough the YouTube grind is. Uh, go try it. Respect to Kyle. Day after day, you work hard, man. Let me buy you a drink in Vegas. The reason I'm able to do this is because you watch these videos, so I should buy you a drink because you're the one keeping the damn dream alive. But I just want to point out here that it's just um, it's it's just hilarious because I, I post a video almost every day. If you go back on my about page, it should say that I posted about 1,500 videos. I've been doing this for about almost five years now. We're pulling up on five years in the next few months at the end of the year. I started right at January 1st of 2019. And I've literally posted, what is that? Three, that's 26, 27 videos a month. So I'm posting a video damn near, you know, minus four or five days that I take off from posting videos. So if you treat it like a job, it tends to respect you in return by if you know, like if you pay attention, I mean, there's money here if you put effort and time into it. But moving on, uh, wouldn't it be worth it to take the opportunity and pay the 1% penalty per month? 
until next year. There are four months left uh, counting September and never play that game with the CRA when it comes to the TFSA. You risk losing for life the tax-free status. Absolutely not worth the risk. This is in regards to uh, me discussing I'm in this waiting period because to buy this piece of real estate we bought. I liquidated my entire tax-free savings account because it was the only way I could tax efficiently get free money without the government touching it to put a down payment with a fairly sizable one. And at this point, I'm just waiting till the end of the year when it rolls over and I'm kind of stacking cash, right? Like I, I don't want to really invest the cash, just have to sell it. And I, I guess I could start investing it even in a high interest savings ETF or whatever. I don't have that much ca stack capital yet. At the beginning of the year, I'll probably pull another five or 10,000 out of the corporation pay myself, put a bit of tax money aside. I've been saving up money right now. I think outside of the emergency fund, I maybe have an extra two or three grand right now on top of that to throw in my TFSA. I want to try and get between 15, maybe closer to 20,000 by the end of the year to start rebuilding it back. Cause I think I have like $168,000 worth of contribution room. And yeah, I'm not going to play the game with messing around because if you uh, don't follow the TFSA rules, they penalize you. And I just don't want them watching my accounts because I've been very fortunate in that account. And I don't need them saying, oh, you did something nefarious. We want you to pay tax on those gains, blah, 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 blah. So fingers crossed. Um, VDY has way too high energy weighting. Now, VDY is probably one of my favorite Canadian ETFs. And I do have it right now in in the corporation for short term, because I am going to end up probably putting it in growth when I start buying it back in my TFSA. But nonetheless, taking a look here, I think you have to understand what this ETF is used for, because most of it isn't even energy. Most of it's 56% of it is financial. So it's highly uh, overly concentrated in one sector and 26% is energy, which I would debate because they, they claim pipelines as energy pipelines isn't a sector. It's part of the energy sector. So I really wouldn't say that much as an energy, just because the two major holdings are pipeline like Enbridge and TC energy. Um, but I do like this stock. I just don't like it as a total holding in a portfolio. If you're looking for some good monthly passive income, this is by far the best Canadian ETF I have found over the years that can achieve that. I think it's paying up 4.8% right now, minus the 0.2% fee. You're still well over 4.6. I mean, we're talking about, yeah, 4.85. So your total yield is 4.65 after the annual management fee. But that's a really healthy fee for the amount of money that you're able to bring in. And it's downtrending. It, it's definitely like no crazy performance here because the banks have been getting hit uh, relatively hard in this cycle. But that's why I still think it's an incredible buying opportunity just to, to immediately cost average into the up, upmost best Canadian dividend stocks with the upper weightings being the best like Royal Bank, Toronto Dominion, Enbridge. And yeah, I just um, I don't think you should buy this in total in a portfolio. It's a small percentage of my portfolio, but I think it's still one of the best ways for uh, Canadians to kind of get that that beautiful, juicy uh, passive income without having to overweight individual stocks. Uh, besides AbbVie and J&J, Enbridge is my third largest holding with close to a thousand shares. Been dripping it for years, compounding beast. Yeah, Enbridge is one, like I mentioned, I've never really um, had the fortitude to buy it. I might have owned it at one point for a brief period of time. I'm glad I can own it through an ETF. Um, but Enbridge is interesting right now because I've never seen a stock that's so widely hated. When I talk about it on TikTok, I get some regular comments of people thinking it's going bankrupt. But here's a comment from a guy that actually works uh, for Enbridge. So he says, I work for Enbridge as a utility locator uh, for their services and major pipelines. This year has been a terrible year, uh, basically in terms of work workload as there has been a lot of pipe restoration, mismanagement specifically in Toronto. Also the fact uh, that a lot of their business comes from uh, new builds or home restorations, old home teardown and new builds. Uh, they are doing cost cutting, which I feel specifically in terms of day-to-day uh, -day work. So he's feeling some of the cost cutting. However, my speculation is that they should be able to turn things around if the government commits to building all these new homes they promise. And if they expand to other provinces, as you mentioned, they are ma a massive company and it is really hard to see them going bankrupt. There's pretty much every building, condo, home, commercial property in Ontario is distributed through Enbridge. I have been working with them for, for over seven years and I own the stock in the company also. Uh, object objectively, it is hard to see how they are going to blow up. No pun intended. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like the, there's good and bad to all these companies, but the infrastructure, it's the largest pipeline company globally. They just did that massive acquisition for what is like four billion or it's God knows billions of dollars to buy that, um, that um, what was it like Ohio based. It's based out of like four different states that uh, natural gas uh, it was like a component of one of the major um, utility companies down there, making them basically the largest natural gas powerhouse in North America now. Like they're really giving themselves a foothold in the future to some extent on that. Uh, but I really enjoyed 
the section of the vid sharing your conclusion that investing needs to be uh, to kind of be put on the sidelines periodically to prioritize the people closest to you and just live your life in short time. I've been into the market. I can already tell how easy a person can be get tunnel vision and seeking stock performance while everything outside of that is being blurred. I got my subscription today, man. Thumbs up. I do appreciate uh, the subscription for sure. And yeah, I mean, I've been talking uh, pretty relentlessly about family issues, friend issues, and I don't have the dedication or the tunnel vision I used to have to really trust what I'm doing within the markets during these times. I do. I'm lucky my jobs in this industry. So I do have a feel. I am looking again and still picking some individual stocks, but I think people, um, I, I don't know, it depends what stage in your life you're in. Cause I talk about the decade jail period where you want to lock yourself up for 10 years, live as frugally as humanly possible, start as early as humanly possible. If you can start at 19, 20 earlier on, if you're watching these videos, you have the luxury of seeing this stuff. Yeah. Just, just give yourself 10 years of living on someone's couch, living in your parents' basement. I mean, you know, sharing, a, like basically do co-ed apartments and just, cash flow is 50% plus of your income and bank it because it takes 10 to 20 years to make a million dollars, right? That's like the average. Typically it's 15 to 20, but we're trying to fast track it here, right? Like that was my initial goal always. So I cut off so much of my life. I don't buy fancy things, use cars. I buy phones outright. Like we buy used phone. We did that for so long and it put us in this position we're in today, whereas a lot of people are struggling, right? So I think it's always prudent to lock yourself up and give yourself that tunnel vision, but do it when you're young. Because like we're old enough now that I want time with family. We were going to move to Alberta, but it just didn't make sense. Because I'm like, Alberta, we could semi-retire literally right now. But the problem is, is like I'm 30, in my 30s now, you know, I'm so connected to family and friends and health issues and all this stuff going on. I just, I couldn't see myself flying back twice a month conveniently. So we just bit the bullet. Uh, you know, we bought a property here instead so we wouldn't have to deal with the insane housing and rental costs. But I mean, that that's something that I think when you're younger, you can get away with. Because if I was 20, I would just leave the province of Ontario, forget Toronto, forget these big cities, go move to Alberta, go move somewhere in the States that's more affordable and find a reasonable job probably in if honestly i went back i would probably just get into the uh the trades right something that where you can get paid to start working or start a side hustle or do something where you're immediately getting paid and just because the earlier you start with that the money compounds so damn quick i should be a good example of that because me and my uh, fiance have accumulated like over eight hundred thousand dollars in less than a decade i think we've been doing this for eight years my fiance has only been doing this probably for the last oh god probably only the last few years i think she only got in the market at the bottom of the 2020 pandemic crash. So it's just prudent, right? Uh, but nonetheless, hi, in mine is mine medicine. Oh my God, you're taking me back. Good. Is it a good stock to invest in? I have $2,000 to invest. Best advice, please looking for long term. So firstly, I don't want to pull a meet Kevin here and get sued like he's been doing. Um, so I'm not going to give you an investment advice because there's time horizon. How much money are you making? Is 2K all you have? I don't know any of that stuff, but I can give you some insight on mine med because God, does that take me back, man? Mine med was like the pinnacle of the best market. Market, one of the best unicorns I ever caught. I wanted to make a little like short list of logos of all the stocks where I caught like major unicorns because uh, there wasn't a lot, but man, did those things add up during a good period in the markets. The first one being the MJ markets. God, that was easy money. I don't know how long you guys have been around for, but when I started investing in 2014, I wish I was more spec. I wish I was just more ballsy. Could have been in a much better place, but obviously, you know, in retrospect, I'm still very happy for where I'm at. But my God, me and my mother, my mother introduced me to the stock market when I was what, like 23 years old. I just paid off over $20,000 in debt after starting a business. And I told my mom, I'm like, damn, I just, I wish there was an easier way. I wish I could just give someone money and get paid off their business. And that's when the Holy Grail opened up. And my mother was like, have you ever looked at the stock market? God bless her soul. That was the day I had that epiphany, that awakening, that holy crap, all of a sudden I'm in the matrix, the hydro lines coming into the wall, turning the lights on. I mean, everything from my phone. I just realized, holy crap, I can own everything. I could own a piece of everything around me and own enough of it to pay those bills. I could own enough of the gas company to pay my gas forever. I could own enough of the insurance company to cover my insurance bill. Hell, $10,000 in a telecom giant right now covers the phone bill forever for the rest of your life, for as long as those suckers are around. I mean, it's such an epiphany to wake up to, right? And my medicine was like one of these ones along with, so I think I had Canopy, I had mind med. Um, I had some bad ones. I'm not trying to gloat here. Keep in mind. It's just when these things blow up over a thousand percent, you know, it's, it really makes up for even a hundred percent loss, but mind med, 
Canopy, Tesla, Apple were probably my four biggest bangers because uh, I got an Apple super early on. I think I had an 800% gain on that by the time I sold it all. I remember that at the peak, my dividend was like 5% yield on cost, which was absurd. But Mind Medicine today, man, the psychedelic industry is really, um, you know, we, we hold some shares in this actually. I don't really share my small caps as much because I don't, I like talking about them periodically. I try not to share them too much because I don't want people to get hyped in and be like, oh, he's doing this, so I should do that. I really only speculate with maybe like five or $10,000, but we do hold a little bit of Mind Med still just for nostalgic stake, for nostalgic reasons because man that was the era that that was just what a magical time and it bothers me so much because i still think psychedelics can change the world i still think there's huge potential in it i don't know if now is the time maybe put a couple bucks in it if you like it but honestly this sector has been absolutely decimated and as far as i can tell there's only one company right now in canada that has licensing to actually sell psychedelic like psilocybin like actual chemical out of the mushroom uh to basically end of life patients in, in dire need. So like my buddy had uh, terminal cancer and uh, I was trying to get him to sign up to it. He wouldn't do it. Um, God bless his soul, rest in peace. But yeah, if you're, you can only get access to that stuff right now through that. And I really hope this story comes back up because I really think, you know, this will become one of the largest drug segments sometime in the near future. we got to just wait for the trials and see how that stuff goes. And speaking of that, I don't know if you guys uh, watched the movie yet. I, you've got to watch it. We'll watch some of the trailer here. Not too many spoilers, but man, oh man. Dumb money during that era. This my fiance got in the market right at this time. She got very fortunate with a few stocks as well. And like we just watched this movie yesterday. We went to the movies, watched it as soon as it came out. And it's got to be one of the best financial movies I've ever watched, especially if you lived through this era, um, because it was so magical. This this time is I don't know when we ever go back to a time like that where you know, there was just so much going on and, and there was so much potential and there was so much room for newbies to get in and see success. Also blow their accounts up because people took ex extreme amounts of risk. But let me just show you the quick, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you just, just watch a little bit. How much did you make today? Five million. How much did we lose today? A billion. You got rich dudes pissing in their pants right now. Yeah, this this was. Uh, I will tell you, I've never. I, I, don't want, I really don't want to get uh, flagged on this video, but maybe one more stock and talk about why I think it's interesting. And that stock is GameStop. I love this guy. Yeah, this uh, movie really touched home. I mean, we we were so excited after this man, like it was so giddy, and I was like, oh my god, you remember this time? What a time to be in the markets. Everyone's locked down during the pandemic, and Roaring Kitty just kind of took the internet by storm just by, you know, short squeezing the crap and making Melvin Capital go bankrupt. God, man, what a time. It'll be, you know, history books. It'll be probably, I, I really hope it's not the end of the best times, but I think I'll look back on that as probably being the peak of like, you know, just investing for me and just the, the hype and how many people got involved and just everyone in Robin Hood, man, what a, what a fascinating period. Getting back into it. Do you like CNR at these levels and the dividends uh, are less than 3%? Would you buy it? Uh, CNR and CP are both probably some of the best Canadian stocks ever. Uh, honestly, I think Canadian National Railway, you could buy outright. But in my humble opinion at this point, I think if you're contemplating the dividend, because obviously it's 2.13%, but if you're contemplating the dividend on this, you want to hold it, you want some growth vectors in your portfolio, this is a good way to go about it. But I really like VCE. I think if you want broad Canadian exposure, instead of trying to allocate and figure out how to weight those kind of companies, VCE does a pretty good job of that. Um, this is basically just like the S&P of the Canadian markets. I'll show you just some of the top holdings because it really just gives you both of those and at reasonable um, position sizing. Uh, where is it here? Yeah. So Royal Bank, 7%, Toronto Dominion, 6 Then you got Shopify. Then you got Canadian Pacific Railway, Canadian National Railway. These two holdings make up, uh, what is that, just under 9% of the entire ETF. So it's great diversity, and you're pretty exposed to those those two railways. I do like the, this Canadian broad ETF. I haven't bought it yet, uh, but it's a great way to get a 3.36% yield, very low cost. You could pair it with an S&P 500, and you're absolutely crushing it. Um, and then finally, maybe we'll finish up with a few more. We'll do some of your Q&As, and then we're going to step back and back to the future, baby. Because uh, I do want to uh, point out some really interesting videos I found on TikTok. Uh, but unless this company is going bankrupt, this is dirt cheap right now. Bye, 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 baby. Yeah, I was talking about Parcel Pals. It's one of the more speculative companies I, I took a small position in because I've been working with them. Uh, that was a guy I met like three years ago when he took over the company and everyone kept saying it was going bankrupt and the dudes pretty much turned the company around to profitability. I'm buying it because of the CEO. I, if I saw that stock 
just at the blue, I wouldn't have personally bought it. But because I believe in the guy and I've known him for so long, sometimes you get personal relations with people. Obviously, I'm not insider trading by any metric here. I'm trying to pump and dump the stock. Same thing with the Duro Clean Technologies. Same thing with like MyMed. I own a little bit of crypto. I got a small speculative portfolio, right, um, that I do appreciate. But let's get into some of the comments, questions. And then I really want to take a look at some of these TikToks because honestly, the way people looked at at the future from back then they were almost spot on it's just i don't want to spoil anything yet but uh, oh nice uh let's get into this oh nice i probably read the write-up and then as i do the uh the read and blog occasions it looks like you guys are getting into a conversation my original goal was five thousand a month in dividends um and blew right through that target congratulate you got five thousand a month in dividends bro my goodness gracious i'd love to see that portfolio do a patrick we need to do a, a portfolio reveal my man uh, if you check his uh, interviews, who are we talking about? Are you? Oh, you're at. I, I gotta know who's making five thousand a month off dividends. That's pretty astounding. Uh, you're saying if you check uh, his interview series, I'm there as a nice uh, as twelve thousand a month. Is my eyes popped out? I, I gotta dive into this a little farther. What are you guys talking about? Yeah, I remember when uh, MindMed uh, <laughs> Drone FLT, good food company. Um, what are you talking about? Remember MyMed, Drone, FLT, good food. Oh, yeah, the very good food company, I think, is what you're talking about. Jeremy never talks about that anymore. That was uh, I actually got sponsored by them, and now they're bankrupt, which was crazy because the growth rate they were on was mind-boggling. Kyle, I have over 12000 in dividends. Glad to show you uh, the receipts as proof. Are you talking about a month or are you talking about a year? Annually, that's still pretty good, too, but a month. My God, bro, you're, you're on a whole nother level. What's the worst investment you ever made? Um, I've made a few. GEO Group was really bad. I don't think it was the worst. I think I took about a 40, uh, probably a top 50% loss on that one. Um, I really like prison stocks. And I actually ended up, I'm not going to tell you what the series was, but I am on Netflix because I was relentlessly talking about the morals being put aside, understanding prisons would always be around. And I thought it was a great cheap investment and it paid a huge dividend yield. Um, and they made me look like trash. Uh, my fiance made fun of me on that Netflix special for a very long time. Uh, I think, I don't know if I have a recording of it somewhere, but there, I won't tell you what you can dig for it and see if you can find it. It's about prisons, obviously. Um, but I also bought, um, what I really love was space. Space was popping off. Virgin Galactic came public through a SPAC. There was a company called Momentus and I had great, great passions for the space industry because God, who wouldn't want to own SpaceX? Um, and basically this company called Momentus, they were a space utility company, the only of its kind, where they said they could drop the cost of satellites dramatically by instead of replacing satellites and just bringing them down or letting them burn in the atmosphere, we'll send robots up, robotics to fix the satellites. We can do repairs. We'll be a utility company. And they had an initial agreement with SpaceX until the Russian uh, CEO, who was uh, an asylum seeker, uh, I guess the, the U.S. government did not like that. Um, so he was basically forced to step out of his position. The stock crashed. Hell, even Chris Hatfield, uh, you know, you, you remember the Spaceman song? Uh, beautiful uh, video. He was actually on the board of directors. Like the board of directors was amazing. The contracts they had lined up was amazing. Love the company. But, you know, there's just things you can't be aware of. And that was another really bad pick for me. I think that one I don't think was as bad as GEO Group because I didn't have as much money. And I think I only took like a 20 or 30 percent loss on that one. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've had my fair share of losses. They were just, I mitigate them, right? Because I, I have some kind of squirrely, man. When I start losing money, I, I got to question the investments and pay attention to what's going on. And I have no problem clicking that sell button pretty quick if, if my opinion changes overnight. Uh, do you have a blog or anything, Patrick? Oh, I see where the blog conversation came in. Anyone investing in gold? Uh, <laughs> they uh, A year ago, they said it would be all-time highs. Haven't heard a thing. Gold, I hate a lot. I do like gold miners, even though they've dramatically underperformed because you get access to a faster ability to grow asset value because they discover gold. They find like maybe like a half a billion ounces or a hundred thousand ounces. I mean, you do the math, it adds up pretty quick to a market capitalization value. Physical gold, I wish I could show you some because I have collector's gold. I don't tend to buy like just fat, fat gold bricks because I think the collector stuff actually appreciates a lot better over time. So I bought like I think it was an 1800s gold franc. I, I've got like the shipwreck silver coins from the Grisapa when they discovered that in Spain. Um, I did, we have some precious metals, nothing crazy. We have some old bills, a lot of a fun little collector's edition of precious metals, but I don't like them as an investment. They're a terrible investment. Uh, looking at VDY, um, have XEI at the moment. XEI is okay as well. It's kind of underperformed uh, VDY, but they're both pretty good ETFs. Um, I am surprised Kyle doesn't uh, talk deeper about Bitcoin and the absolute scarcity of this asset. Yeah, I don't 
pump crypto as much. I made a video on it. I try and leave it alone because of the scammers. Anytime I talk about crypto, my comment section, I can't read a single comment. It's all spam. So I just kind of shuffle it under the counter as just a little protective measure. It just, you know, I, I like the asset as a, as a decentralized asset, but I think the real value in crypto is going to be in the next bubble, the next bull run, which will inevitably be a bubble, which is going to be gaming. I, I promise you, I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm keeping an eye on it, but gaming is going to be the next thing that launches crypto into the atmosphere. Uh, mark my words on it, baby. You'll come back to this video and be like, damn, Kyle is right. Gaming, forget forget nfts i mean and nfts will be a part of it but forget like smart contracts forget banking forget all the traditional oh we can use crypto like cash like bitcoin cash forget all of that just watch i promise you gaming is going to be the next launch and i'm going to play that sucker i'm going to be buying some of the infrastructure plays in the crypto sector not now it's too risky right now though i'd rather buy the pump i also have dividend portfolio stocks not etfs i'm collecting uh just over twelve thousand per month as you mentioned yes you crazy Mother Effa, that is a wild amount of income. We should do a video together, Patrick. You could be a, you could sit in the dark room and just have some backlighting so we don't see your face, and we should uh, do a deep dive together because that would be a video, man. You're, I think you've surpassed Gen X dividend investor. <laughs> that is a wild, wild thing. A uh, big year for MyMed. MyMed is still conducting tests. Yes, when those trials come through, I think there's going to be more potential than we can imagine. It's just a lot for that stock to come back from a 90% loss. They diluted way too much. Again, we still hold some though. We'll see how it goes over the long term. Uh, I invest 50% of my income. You will be able to retire in probably 20 years or less. 50% of your income will fast track your retirement in a way that is unimaginable. On year three of 10 year prison sentence, congrats, my man. I'm on year eight, but as of late, I've cut back quite a bit, but I'm still saving a crap ton of my, I think I'm still putting like, Maybe not 50%, but at least 35, 40% of my income I'm still socking aside. Actually, it's probably more than that because I only think about my salary income. When it comes to this business, I pretty much sock all of that money away. I mean, I just invested some of it. I've been stacking cash. I mean, that my business income, I don't even pretend like it exists, um, but I've probably been investing much, yeah, probably closer to 40 or 50% easy. I uh, bought more uh, uh, both uh, today, minutes before closing. I bought my VOO position at closing. Uh, what do you think about uh, Tormount? Not sure. Eisman uh, must be a landscaper. Yeah, so we're back at the top. Okay, so let's get into this, guys. We've got a lot of questions here, except Patrick uh, would love to and can show you uh, the receipts as proof. I really want to get you on here, man. A pizza. One sec. One more comment. What is this? Pizza, pizza. No fly here. Uh, but in Alberta, Pizza 73, which is owned by... I don't know what you guys are getting into. I'm going to step back comment section is kind of making me squirrely again. Let's get into this because I really want to give you guys this perspective on how we don't know what goes on in the future. Like, what you don't realize is when you look at fundamentals in a stock, when I watch everything money talk about Tesla, I think they, if Tesla, their Apple, like it doesn't matter what stock you're looking at. Fundamentals aren't the defining factor to making an investment. I don't think you can look at cash flow and just say, because cash flow is good, but the stock's too expensive from a PE standpoint, you can't buy it. It's too expensive. Think about NVIDIA. NVIDIA, when it crashed down as much as it did, everyone still said it was too expensive. The revenues dropped by like 30% or something, 20 or 30%. Like it dropped dramatically. And even like, I mean, Kathy sold the bottoms, Kathy Wood. Everyone was selling the bottoms of that stock. As it pumped, everyone said short NVIDIA. It's overvalued. Hell, I thought it was a bubble. And then they posted numbers that you could not freaking imagine. There is a huge fundamental to business development um, when things evolve. And you can't predict that stuff. So you have to have some kind of gut feeling, some faith. There's always faith in investing. I mean, that's that's the raw fact of it, right? So you can't, you fundamentals are a great place to start. But at the end of the day, I mean, half my money, like when you look at MindMed and Canopy and a lot of these stocks, I was making really simple bets. Like Microsoft was probably my simplest bet. I mean, when I bought Microsoft along with Apple, I had one thing. The only thing that made me buy Microsoft was I like Xbox. I use Xbox. Gaming is a huge proponent of Microsoft. I do like PCs. I use PCs. I use their soft. I mean, this is a, it should be a simple company. I didn't care about revenues. I didn't care about cash flow. When I bought Apple, people said that the iPhone had peaked. You go watch Martin Shkreli before he went to jail. I'm glad he's out of jail. I still watch his streams. The pharma bro was trying to talk the YOLO wolf off a cliff. If you don't remember YOLO wolf, this was a kid that got an inheritance who bet it all against Apple. And that was like six or seven years ago. These idiots thought Apple peaked several years ago and lost all their entire money shorting it. I mean, you got to understand, like, we don't know what the future is, but you have to have some hope. Your, your glass should always be half full or you will never find success 
in the stock market. And this is a prime example. Take a listen to this. This is freaking awesome. I really like watching old videos where people tried to predict what the future would be like. Take, for instance, this 1992 episode of Beyond 2000, a TV series that explored future technologies. In it, they talked about portable computers, essentially their way of predicting how smartphones would eventually look. Let's see how they did. For the 21st century executive, there will be no need to stop work just because you've left the office. Let's say you have a letter to get out. With the Porter office, you have three options. You can type it on the touch sensor keyboard, hand write it on the electronic notebook, or if you need to be hands-free, dictate it using speech recognition directly onto the page. When you're done, a camera located here records the image and it's then faxed using, say, a cellular network back to your secretary. That leaves you time to make a few extra calls on your way home. How awesome is that? Basically, they predicted everything that a cell phone was going to be. They just didn't understand how advanced the form factor was going to be. It's literally everything a cell phone does. Like, it's crazy. Same thing when we look to the future now. Like, we know what the future is going to be about, but it's probably not going to be maybe the form factor we could be considering. But it's crazy that they knew what was coming, right? Like, here's another one. In 1987, Tomorrow's World, a former British television series about future technologies, took a shot at what they thought the people of the future would look like. Let's see how they did. Greetings, 20th century people. I'm wearing uh, part of the gear of the future. Well, it may look like today's, but it's not what it seems. The suit is chemically treated to make it thermosensitive. It absorbs heat when you're hot, thus cooling you down, and releases it again when, you, when you're cold, so you maintain a constant temperature. Well, I don't have much in my pockets, few smart cards, uh, holograms of my family, and we finally solved the problem of lost keys. Don't have any in the first place. <laughs> Each unique fingertip opens all the different doors in my life when I press them against pattern recognition pads. I also carry my doctor round with me. A tiny biosensor under my tongue analyzes chemical changes in my saliva and radios any changes that I ought to know about to my tie which changes color so I can intercept most illnesses before they become a problem. And I uh, carry my office round with me as well. Now this isn't uh, just a watch or just a TV phone. It's, uh, if you look, it might have Maggie underneath. Wave, Maggie. It's also satellite connected, so I can uh, receive information, any information I want from any computer I have access to around the world. And uh, I carry a printer for that information in my briefcase so that when I get a, a message, it all prints out like that. But oh, what else have I got in here? How about this for a bit of future entertainment? This is my 3D TV and I can shut out the world for the brief moments that I'm still stuck on mass pub public transport systems. Well, we uh, take full responsibility for our predictions, so someone will be, will be back in 20 years' time to analyze just what happened to tomorrow's person. How insane is that? It's just like, again, so much of this was, was fairly spot on. I, I mean, we're not really too caught up, I think, in the medical front. The medical front's got some ways to go, but I mean, even the Apple Watch is monitoring like a lot of health stuff, right? And it's just, oh man, so mind blowing. I almost got the VR stuff right. They really didn't get the phone thing though, eh? The phone thing was just like such a far-fetched thought to these people. They were really kind of overstretching, but this one had a lot of cool uh, aspects to it. I got one more for you though. One more uh, little gem here, a little different. In 1979, the BBC attempted to predict the office of the 2000s, which they imagined would no longer be at the workplace, but right at home. Oh, That's yeah, because the office of the future, already called a workstation, is so self-contained that it can exist almost anywhere, provided there's a telephone and electrical supply. So, the necessary visual display unit, the electronic keyboard, computer and printer, can be set up in your own house. Doesn't change that and much. far more of us could be working from home by 1981. Good news for people with young children. All this workstation could be shared on a neighborhood basis for those who don't have the time, the petrol, hey, it's we or work. the inclination to commute to work. So this technology already offers a choice of lifestyle. But does it improve efficiency? Well, when I arrive at my workstation, first of all, I key in my personal card which tells the equipment who I am, giving clearance to all information relevant to me. It also registers my time of arrival, which is important for the future, 
when there's going to be more flexi time. Yeah, no now, one's docking hours. There's anymore. a message waiting for me already. So let's see what that is. I've got to go to a conference in New York and they want me to get some information on two delegates, Norman and Simpson. You can see she's still not used to using the computer. It's going to be possible <laughs> to combine any text, graphics or pictures like these and then pass them on to anyone else in the world with a similar terminal. But first of all, I want a hard copy of that. That would be very useful. There we are. Now, if I'm going to America, I obviously need to get a ticket. So I'll get some information on that. Now, that data service tells me the details. So I need to book now Heathrow to New York. It's a little and more they're offering me a flight on Concord. And I can actually pay for it directly with my credit card. Press the right button. And I can actually get oh, not too much my to ticket. Here. Now, this is all done by microelectronics, which replace people and even simulate their voices. Well, now, we're there before now. I go, I want to check my electronic diary. Now, for the days I'm well, going to be away, <laughs> business details as well. Very useful. And it could all be possible within a few years. A system that improves efficiency by cutting down paperwork and allowing us to communicate without today's middlemen the telephone operators, ticket clerks. And wow, stuff. telephone operators, oh my God. I wasn't alive for that, but every time those people made calls, somebody had to do an in-between connection. I think that was up till probably what, the, the mid eighties, late eighties, I think. Was it go that far back? Maybe, but nonetheless, this, this stuff is just so damn wild to me because it just shows like people like Steve Jobs, for example, like it's not like the guy innovated anything crazy new, right? Like it reminds me when you listen to, uh, uh, is it Steve Wozniak, the partner who like constructed it all, that they were just taking technologies that already existed and kind of just melding them together, right? So it's just kind of neat how people think Thing, you know, they just invented this stuff. Like, I mean, the Apple Watch, it clearly, it just took time for the technology to get good enough for it to get there. But it's not like a new idea by like any metric, right? So it's just crazy to me that like, these ideas have been here for a long time, right? This It's just nothing new. So it's kind of neat to try and take that and project it out of the future and say, okay, like, everything's probably gonna look similar to how it is now. It's just the advancements in it, I think it's going to be like Wally. I think I think with the day we get to like robots walking around like Elon Musk is dreaming of it, I think that's the day that like shit just becomes so surreal that it's like it's like every sci-fi movie you could have ever imagined during our time. Um, we imagine the future and then we create it. Yeah, literally. I mean, Back to the Future is a good example. That movie uh, pointed out a lot of interesting things. I mean, like you even look at some of the way we travel today, even that like when it comes to like electric bikes and like boosted boards and just how like all these toys have changed. Let alone VR. I think VR is if you will step back in time and forget the iPhone, that's cool, but show them VR and I think their minds would be absolutely for how You know what's funny? Uh, I like getting people's reactions because I'm kind of used to the VR now. Uh, my uh, The guy that manages the uh, the amenities, because I use the sauna a lot here, the pool, uh, I go down and I was joking with the guy. I'm like, because he just, uh, it, we were just shooting the shit. And I'm like, yo, have you ever like tried VR? Because he's playing like Star Trek games. He's a bit of an old school guy. And he's like, ah, when it gets better, he's like, I want the suits or like the gloves. When they start coming out with that stuff, maybe. I'm like, you've never tried it though, right? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll be back. So like half an hour later when he was finishing up, I came back and I let him try the Oculus. And he was just floored. I'm like, bro, unless you tried it, you don't know, baby. You, you just don't know. Um, but <laughs> condo flows. Yeah, condo flows with water down there. Um, but nonetheless, folks, uh, do set up that drip, my drippity drip. I love my dividends reinvested, baby. That's what I'm trying to get to. Uh, with most of my investments, they can be more passive, right? That way, I think I probably already bought some SEHD when it paid the dividend at last. I should check with my, my uh, how many dividends I got off that almost 50K sitting in there. But nonetheless, folks, it has been a very fun, interesting uh, Friday night. The energy has been brought to you um by yourselves really i really appreciate you all coming out for this we had 60 people just sitting here right now on a friday night so cheers to all of you i hope you have a wonderful uh weekend and uh yeah the market should be very entertaining but hope it stays down for longer i need a good three months i need three months before i can stack my cash in that tax-free advantaged account so cheers to that <laughs> some of you probably want the market to go up but i don't plus my parents are retiring so right now is a great time for them to be cost averaging in but on that note folks stay cool stay awesome and as always I look forward to catching you in the next one.